This is Robert Kraft, and I am your host on SNN Network. And today we're doing a Wall Street View with Brandon Mackey from Small Cap Discoveries. Brandon, welcome to this Wall Street View. Great to be here, Bobby. Thank, Thank you for having me. It's great to have you on. So uh, I know we've done a couple interviews now in the past, both on the podcast and also in person. But for those who don't know, what, what's your background? Sure, yeah. So my background, I'm a chemical engineer by training. And somewhere along the way, I got the value investing bug and started reading up on my own of Benjamin Graham, Warren Buffett, and that led me to start a blog really on my free time uh, called Motology, looking for small cap companies that had a competitive advantage. And that experience uh, got me a job ultimately at a hedge fund in Houston, doing a lot of the same work, running a small portfolio for them. Uh, and through that experience, then I got linked up with a couple investors in Canada and uh, started a newsletter um, called Small Cap Discoveries. Mm -hmm. We're applying a lot of the same practices, but to very, very small, obscure companies, uh, trying to find them well ahead of the mainstream market. And along the way, I also got involved with uh, a, a few startups. Um, took a little diversion, came out to Los Angeles and worked for a company called Soylent uh, for close to four years building that. Uh, and then just last May, I launched my own brand, um, called Keto Farms, and we're an e-commerce brand um, launching consumer products for those in the ketogenic diet. So a lot of stuff in there, um, but a lot of passion for, for investing in business. And as a small plug, I have tried their treats and the coffee, and it's very delicious. Anyways, and I'm not a shareholder. <laughs> Just want to make sure that's out there as well. Anyways, so, <laughs> so anyways... Uh, you know, the reason I wanted to have you on today is because in the last issue of the magazine, the Microcap Review, uh, you wrote an article titled Microcap Investing, Four Reasons Why Share Structure is Critical. Now, before we get into those reasons, for those who don't know, you know, what, what do you mean by share structure? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, share, very simply, is a, a fractional piece of ownership in a company. And the share structure really outlines how that ownership is set up. And so at the most basic level, it's the, the number of shares, which would be the number of pieces in the pie, so to speak. Um, but then it goes a, a step further into the type of share. So common shares are the, well, the most common, as the name implies, but you also have other instruments like warrants, options, convertible notes, and all these can convert to commons in different ratios and can ultimately impact what your true ownership in the company is. And it's really important for you as an investor to understand do you own 0.0001% or 1% obviously can have a huge impact um, when value is ultimately realized through the sale of the company or your sale of the ownership. Right. So the first reason you list in the article is that share structure provides clues into the company's history. Why? Yeah, so it's, it's kind of this classic question that I was thinking if, if a company has a hundred million shares outstanding and it's trading for a dollar or it has 10 million shares outstanding and trading for ten dollars does it make any difference they're both the same valuation and kind of trained under the value investing principles you might think that well just relative to the earnings potential it doesn't matter they're equivalent and what I learned through um, years and years of investing is there's actually a huge difference and because Every time the share structure changes, and typically share structure or the number of shares only go up over time through management issues themselves, options, they make acquisitions. And the faster that the share count is increasing, your percentage in the company is going down. And what you want to see is that you have a management team that truly treats their shares like gold. Mm -hmm. And they're only issuing shares. Uh, when it's absolutely in the best interest for shareholders. And so what you can see is that over time, if you have a company that maybe starts out at 10 million shares outstanding, um, and they're now at 300 million shares outstanding, something's happening there. Maybe they went public too early and thought they had a really good idea and it didn't pan out and they had to raise a whole bunch of money at a low valuation. And all those sorts of things that maybe you're not going to pick up reading the last quarterly filing, but it's really important for you to understand if you're going to be investing with the management team. And so I think much like a stock chart can, can paint the picture of a company, I think looking at the share structure can do the same. Gotcha. 
And then how does share structure help you determine a company's capital allocation scorecard? Yeah, absolutely. So, and this is something that that Warren Buffett talks a lot about. Um, A lot of times the CEO will get to the top by being really good at one thing. Maybe they're a great scientist in a biotech company or they're a great salesman in a software company. But once they become CEO, they have to do that job as well as another job, which is allocate capital. And and share structure is a big part of that because, yes, you can you can raise debt, but typically capital allocation for public companies comes from raising money and and diluting. And so, what management team is faced with every day is constantly looking at: should we fund um, a new business line? Should we invest in R and D? Should we do an acquisition? That's a big one. And if they're going to look at their their shares in dilution and think of it as just an endless source of capital, um, a lot of times you'll you'll have bad results because they won't be diligent about it. And so, oh, Warren Buffett gives the classic example of uh, Henry Singleton of Teledyne, who in the 1960s, when conglomerates were all the rage on the market, he issued share after share and bought up all these companies and created a big empire. Uh, but then in the 80s, when it all crashed and these companies, he was trading at single digit multiples, he completely reversed course and he started buying back his own shares. And all of that has a big impact. And over time, he actually bought out 90% of the company or 90% of the shares outstanding so that your ownership went up an enormous amount. And those are the kind of behaviors that you want to look for in a, in a CEO, but you may not often see if a CEO doesn't have experience with capital allocation. Mm-hmm. And then, and then you actually go on to discuss how share structure then helps you understand the company incentives. And you actually kind of hit on, on this point already a little bit, but you know, for those who may not know, what, what do you mean then here? Yeah, no, absolutely. So if you're going to be investing in a company, you're going to own part of the business. It's imperative that the management team and the people running the show day in, day out also own a meaningful percentage of the business, um, because otherwise, how can your interests be aligned? And uh, a great example is you may, especially in the small and microcap arena where we we operate, you often might might find a company where management is making a few hundred thousand dollars a year in salary, but their ownership in the company is equivalent to say fifty thousand dollars. And so, there, their incentive is to maybe just keep the lights on, play it conservative. You know, don't, don't do anything that would re- jeopardize their job. Um, but as a shareholder, you want them to take calculated risks and maybe do strategic acquisitions or invest in R&D or grow the company. And that's a classic example of where you might have a management team that just wants to coast year after year and then angry shareholders build up. And so, but if everybody's playing on the same team and everyone owns a meaningful equity stake, then there's a kind of mentality we're all on it together and typically what you'll find is better results over time if you're investing in those situations were one where management just there to maybe build build the resume or just take a high salary and so it's really important to look at that before you're making an investment decision mm-hmm. so brandon you round out the article by discussing supply and demand you know and by supply and demand in this sense we're talking about the actual shares that are both available for purchase and or not available because there's just a limited supply. So does this reason have anything to do then with the company's fundamental value? Yeah, there are really two separate things and I'm a fundamental investor through and through. And so this is something that I never really paid a lot of attention to. And I always thought a technical analysis with a little bit of a a voodoo art, so to speak, but what I found the reality is, is trading on the markets ultimately is driven by supply and demand. And certainly a company may have a fundamental value. Let's say the, the intrinsic value of the company is 20 million. And so as the, over time, that buying and selling should ultimately drive the price to that intrinsic value in theory. Uh, but what we find a lot of times in, in these really small companies that have a s- small share structure, a tight float, as they would say, few shares available, that if positive developments come about, say a good earnings report, and there can be a rush of buyers to acquire a position in the company, you can see the, sh- the share price swing and the intrinsic value go, at least temporarily, far beyond 
what the fundamentals would justify. Yeah. And as an investor, that's a that's a great outcome. You have the option then to, to sell at an inflated price. And, and even if you are a fundamental investor, you can capture that profit. And then you can always come back and invest again when it comes back down to earth. And we see time and time again, and particularly if you're talking about the first move up to a certain price level where all the buying is coming in, it's making new and new high after new high. That can be a really great opportunity to take some off the table. Uh, and you're really only going to see that with companies, let's call it less than 50 million shares. It's much harder if there's 300 million shares outstanding. It takes so much buying to really move that, that it's, it's unique in these companies and these opportunities with a tight share structure. So then bottom line, is there a magic number of shares outstanding? <laughs> it's an interesting question, and it's certainly more art than science, but right. we've seen time and time again um, in the 20 to 30 million shares outstanding, and we've really been amazed how many of our biggest winners have come um, from that level. And so I think it's just a great mix of if, if the shares are too too tight and you know, insiders, maybe there's only 2 million shares outstanding, that actually might dissuade, say, an institutional investor or a hedge fund from coming in because there's just not enough there. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the on the flip side, if there's too many shares outstanding, it takes such enormous buying to really push it up, and so much selling could come in to keep the, sh the lid on the share price. But right in that sweet spot, uh, particularly if the fundamentals start to go in the right direction, you can really see some pretty extraordinary price moves. And so. Over time, it's, it's just amazing how that number keeps popping up time and time again. And it's one that we continue to look for when we're starting our due diligence. Right. And one last question as a follow-up, you know, because it seems also from an investor perspective, it really comes down to your strategy. You know, like if you're a trader, you probably want to see more shares outstanding because that probably means the stock is a little bit more liquid. But then when it's a bit tighter, it may be more liquid, but it there may be some other reasons for that. You know, is that something that comes comes to mind when you think about share structure as well? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, a good friend, liquidity is certainly something that, that's on everybody's mind. And um, a good friend of ours who you know as well, Ian Castle of the Microcap Club, he wrote a, a great article that was uh, entitled, Don't Worry About Liquidity, Worry About Being Right. Mm. And, and I think a lot of people get caught up of, oh, well, there's not enough shares outstanding. What am I going to do if something goes wrong? And they just want to have that comfort. Um, and that's great, but that comfort comes at a price. And right. so what we've found is that if you can really focus on the fundamentals, understand it well, have a lot of conviction in your idea, you can be in a position to invest in these tighter share structure companies, knowing that while the liquidity might not be there, and it can be a little scary if you have a couple of bad quarters and you've got a large position, uh, ultimately, as the company performs, stock price goes up, you have to trust that liquidity will come in and you'll ultimately be well positioned for that. But there's certainly some people that, that don't see it like that, but you know, we're not afraid to invest in some really, really small companies and be the only ones buying on some days and some of these tiny things. For sure. So Brandon, where can my audience go and find more information about you and small cap discoveries? Yeah, absolutely. We're just at uh, smallcapdiscoveries.com. You can go on, uh, request a, a free sample report of our work, and uh, subscribe as well if, if you like it. And you can see us uh, out there shredding at Topanga Canyon State Beach uh, tomorrow. And, uh, and Brandon, as always, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you so much, Bobby. It's a pleasure. All right. See you, bud. Bye.